Um, also, as we're recording, you are more than welcome to be on camera. Um, we ask that you are muted unless um, you're asking a question, just because we don't know what, <laughs> what could happen in backgrounds. You just never know. Um, so if you can be cautious of that. And then again, if you are on video, just know that means as the recording, if someone speaks or if we're in gallery, it means it's possible that you'll be recorded and seen later um, in the recording. So just as a heads up. Um, I am Lindy Wagner, the director of the Center for Student Diversity and Inclusion. I'm very excited um, that we have this panel this evening. Um, I'm excited to have you hear a little bit about the data that has been collected, as well as some perspectives of the panelists that are here. Um, it's actually a really, I think, important conversation to be having. Um, so we're excited to have that. Um, and I think that that covers all of my logistics pieces. Um, we will um, be taking questions from the audience. So if you have a question as the panelists are speaking, if you could direct those to me, so direct message me, again, Lindy Wagner in the chat, and I'll take those questions and get them to the panelists. Um, if it's for a specific panelist, I ask that you highlight that in the question so I know how to direct that question. Um, and I think from there, you're more than welcome to interact with one another or inter interact um, and comment to the panelists in the chat. Um, we'll be following that. There's no reason that you can't communicate that way as well. We just ask that you um, stay muted until we open that opportunity up for you to uh, share your thoughts. Um, and with that, I'm going to pass it to Dr. Min Liu to begin the conversation. So, Min. Thank you, Lindy. Um, and it's so good to see everyone. And uh, for those of you who um, I have not met, my name is Min Liu. I'm a professor in the Applied Communication Studies Department in CAS. I've been at SIUE since 2007, and I've always lived in St. Louis. So a lot of tonight's conversations uh, became of great significance to me. Uh, through my work, uh, my community service work in the St. Louis side. And I'm so honored to have with me uh, some of my fellow um, AAPI members of the St. Louis community and their leaders that I admire and I value. So um, tonight's discussion, this panel's discussion is about data. It's about, uh, it's about uh, it's a discussion about data uh, that we've collected, but also speaking from personal experience, which is another important form of data as well. We oftentimes uh, wonder, you know, with all these reports about um, anti-Asian hate sentiments instance, we oftentimes get asked, does it happen in St. Louis? Does it happen in the Midwest? Is it really as bad as it is? Or some people ask, is it a new thing? Will it go away when COVID-19 is no longer an issue? So I think as our panelists today will probably have some good foods for thoughts for all of us. So I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our first speaker. We have um, Honorable Judge Judy Draper. She is a former St. Louis County Associate Circuit Judge. Uh, she's also appointed an honorary consul to the Republic of Korea. I loved how, I love how she always says that in that title and that service position, she sees herself as a goodwill ambassador, because I think that's how she sees herself in a lot of her community initiatives and, and uh, dedication is that she's always trying to establish connections and, and create opportunities and platforms. So um, with, without uh, further ado, um, Judge Judy, I, I had some questions. I know that you'll probably be talking about your personal and professional experiences. You, we you wear many labels uh, and, and I won't you know, go through all of them, but I was wondering if you can share those experiences relating to tonight's topic that might help set the context of, of some of the challenges that we're observing for the community today. All right. Well, thank you uh, very much, uh, Dr. Liu. And I wanna thank um, uh, Lindy Wagner for um, helping to set this up. And it's really good to see Junie Bay and of course, always Caroline uh, Fan. So I have to just say real quickly about Junie Bay. Um, as honorary consul, I used to um, provide essay uh, writing contests and he was one of the early winners uh, a couple of years back uh, of uh, one of the essay writing contests for the honorary uh, consul for the Republic of Korea. So it's really good to see that, you know, he's he's moving forward on, you know, helping the community. Um, so, and without further um conversation, I'll, I'll just go ahead. Um, so um, you mentioned that I was a, um, um, a judge and I was a judge, a state judge for um, over 15 years and a judge overall in municipalities for 20. So I'm still a, a judge for St. Louis County, but I, I'm what they call senior. So I have senior status. So I'm, I'm a retired 
a judge, but they can call me back anytime. And I'm also a municipal judge. Um, so um, men asked me to um, talk about my personal experience uh, rather than all of the, the data, because I know this is a data discussion. So I just want to, as, as quickly as I can, for those of you who are there, give you a, a kind of a background of, of who I am. Uh, so I was born in the Republic of Korea during the Korean War, the cleanup effort, uh, to an African-American uh, soldier and uh, to a Korean uh, mother. And uh, my father brought uh, myself and my sister back to the United States. So I came here at about six years old. So I came here not really being able to speak English. Um, and in terms of um, the discrimination that is being faced now uh, with um, COVID-19 and the blaming of COVID-19 on Asian Americans, uh, I, I wanna say that the, uh, the feeling that I think Americans have uh, with respect to Asians is not something new. Um, it's come out now because of COVID-19 and uh, whenever something bad happens, a lot of times people try to find out who's to blame for it. And so it just so happens because it supposedly originated out of Wuhan, China, that you know um, Asian Americans became the scapegoat for it. But the discrimination against Asian Americans underlies, I think, a problem that has always been since the founding of, of this country, since the early Asians came uh, to help settle this country. So it's interesting that now that um, um, Asian Americans are, are being blamed for COVID-19, that all of this hatred is coming out. Um, and one of the questions I had is if um, the COVID-19 virus had been blamed on, for example, German people or um, um, uh, Mexican or Hispanic people, would that same hate have come out where um, people are being beaten up just because of who they are uh, and in some instances even killed? So that's a question I, I wanted to, to bring up on, on whether it is because of the fact that, that we are minorities versus maybe a majority who might have been blamed for the same thing. And I won't go into all of the, the different um, uh, comparisons I can make when a person of, of color uh, does something terrible versus maybe a, a person uh, not of color. Um, but um, when, when I came to the United States, um, I, um, um, was learning to speak English and the children were making fun of me so badly that I just refused to speak Korean. And I, I told my mother, I wanna be an American and I, I just refused to speak it. Even though she would beat me and say, you're gonna speak Korean, you're gonna speak Korean. I flatly refused. I would have rather taken a beating rather than have this the, an accent and, and speak Korean and have people make fun of me and, and saying that I was speaking this you know, crazy yin yang you know, language. So, you know, it's natural to, to want to be like everybody else. But I will tell you that um, having an American, uh, you know, an African-American father and a Korean mother, I experienced discrimination from, from seemed like everybody because I wasn't one thing. And, you know, it, and it's been all my life that I have experienced this, but you can't dwell in that. You have to keep moving forward. Um, so, you know, recent incidences of, of that, um, I will tell you that, um, uh, for example, when I was up for election, uh, because as a state judge, we, in some parts of the state, you have to run for what's called retention. I was really surprised when one of the local high schools back in, I think it was 2012 or, or 2014, I don't remember the year, but it was long before COVID that one of the high school um, uh, teachers put my picture up to tell his students, his 10th grade students, to go home and tell their parents not to vote for me um, because uh, he felt like I, you know, I was not qualified to be a judge, even though I had been a judge at that time for probably 12 years. 
Um, and one of the high school students, a young boy, raised his hand and he said, well, you know, when he put my picture up in that particular picture, I look very Asian. And um, the high school boy, you know, young boy said, well, she needs to go back to China. And it dawned on me that why would he say that? You know, why in, in you know, 2012 or whenever it was, why would, why would a young boy feel comfortable enough to say that. So that that's, you know, one instance, um, you know, uh, and I could tell you many more, but I don't want to take up all of, of the time. Um, but um, as, a, as a young child on the African American side, you know, I had friends from all different nationalities. And I remember um, when I was in grade school, um, one of my friends, we used to go to um, catechism together for, for church. And um, she came home one time and saw my father, who's a very dark skinned black man. And she said, who is that? And I said, that's my father. She said, oh my goodness. She said, I didn't know your father was a, and used the N word. So then she said, I can't play with you anymore. And I was just heartbroken because that was my father, you know? And when she said, well, I didn't know he was the N word. And I was like, I didn't know he was either because I was only about maybe um, nine or 10 years old. And I, I just did not know. So you see, so th th this discrimination against people who are different than, than you are, this is a, a, a longstanding uh, problem. And with respect to the Asian side of it, um, when we were very young living in Sacramento, California, and some of you may already know about this. Um, and my mother and I used to go to the grocery store and she would hold my hand and when we would go to the grocery store, kids would pick up rocks and throw them at my mother, hurl them at my mother and me. But I was too small to do anything about it. And they were yelling at her, go back to China. You know, you chink, go back to China. And I thought, well, these little kids, where are they getting this anti-Asian sentiment? And I'm talking about back in the, you know, in the late 60s in Sacramento, California, where there are a lot of Asians. So um, this isn't anything new. It's just that I think for many reasons, um, and part of it is the, the model minority myth that, that we, we um, share, but we become invisible sometimes. But now that there is a, a reason that a lot of people think that they can um, criticize Asian Americans, um, you see that we're not so invisible anymore. So the people have been harboring these kinds of animosities towards um, Asian Americans for you know probably a long time. I hate to say that, but um, it's it's not anything new. It's just that there's they have a reason. Those who would do that now have a reason to let out their hate. And you know, uh, uh, in 2019, this is the last thing I'll, I'll say. In 2019, I think the rise against. Um, um, uh, Asian hate increase, and that was before COVID. And I don't want to mention anything political because, as as judges, you know, we're not supposed to really be, uh, be political at all. But it seems that some something happened in our country recently, where people who are anti anything different than they are have almost been given kind of a license to 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 complain about it, and. And so it's, you know, it's something that, that if, if it rose back in 2019, then there's, there's a, a, a movement or a wave uh, going in our country. And, and then I think it might be because, I don't know, um, I, I don't have all the answers, but I think it's because our country, the demogra dem demographics in the United States is changing, rapidly changing. And the majority has known this um, for about the past 20 years, they knew that this was coming. And they knew by 2030, which is, you know, not too, too far away, definitely the entire United States is going to be 100% multicultural. It will not be white male dominated. Even though we see the powers that be tend to be white male dominated. So I think that an organization like these that are, that are springing up at, and have been there all over the country are very important mm -hmm. so that we 
educate each other and so we do involve each other so that we don't um, end up on the bottom, even though we are the majority, that we don't end up on the bottom of, of the power grid and who controls you know, everything. So I think it's really important that we recognize it. Um, but I think part of, the, of this is a pushback to um, this belongs to us, it doesn't belong to you. And so we want to make sure that you understand that and all of our laws, et cetera, will be um, um, uh, manipulated so that whatever is out there to be had, you're going to be at the end of the line and not the front of the line. So that, and that I know I'm being very um, general about it, but um, that's pretty much how I, I, I see things. Um, and um, I'm, I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, there are so many experiences that I have and I don't wanna list them all in terms of actually facing you know, discrimination because I wanna be positive uh, about things, but you know, I'm, I'm here to help. And um, th thank you very much for giving me this time. Thank you, and, and I think we will have time for questions um, later. Um, so, and I loved what you said about wanting to stay positive. And I, I, I just in case I for, we forget to get to it, but um, many of the St. Louis region's Asian American advocacy and community organizations exist today because of your vision, you know, decades ago. You helped establish many of those. So we owe you a, a big thank you for that. So next, um, we have a junior Bay, um, seen, junior, soon to be senior at Metro Academic and Classical Academy. And uh, he's also a student leader of the St. Louis-based Asian American Youth Organization, AACS, and he will take it away from here. Uh, yes, hello. Um, my name is Junie Bay and I have this presentation here for you today. So, Hold on. There we go. ACS was founded in 2018 by a group of civically minded Asian American students um, from a variety of schools in the St. Louis area. And they started ACS to increase Asian American participation in activism, leadership, and volunteering. And by encouraging Asian youth to become more involved in their community, ACS hopes to develop the community's social and political mindset as a whole. So recently in March, after the spark in um, the rise in Asian American hate crimes and um, what we've seen in a lot of national statistics, we wanted to do our own anonymous survey with St. Louis Asian American youth locally to see if the same trends apply here. So we used Google Forms to ask nine short questions asking about the youth's experience with racist remarks, their level of concern about anti-Asian hate crimes and potential solutions um, the youth might have, and we distributed on Instagram and shared among local high school students. And we also have some testimonies that I'm going to share now. So here are two of the survey testimonies that we found. And these were very uh, pertinent for me. And um, I think they're really indicative of the larger problem that we're seeing. So the first is from a 10th grader living in St. Louis County who is a Chinese American. And they said, uh, my mom owns a Chinese American restaurant. At the beginning of the pandemic, right before lockdown, my mom encountered a customer that asked her if she was happy. So she answered yes. The customer then said, why are you happy when your people spread this virus to America and continue to make other racist remarks? And I think um, this just goes to show that a lot of people, um, as Judge Judy was talking about, are seeking for people to blame. And although um, this um, family has no connection to the spread of the virus, they're still blaming. And also the fact that as Asian Americans, we have all, always throughout history been viewed as this perpetual foreigner, um, as seen in the language the, the person used with your people, um, rather than looking, us as, looking uh, at us as Americans. And the second testimony is from a ninth grader living in St. Louis County, and he is also a Chinese American. And or, or they said, um, tons of Trump supporters use these derogatory terms to talk about COVID. And we've had family friends that have had trash left in their mailbox with remarks like, go back home. My friends and I have been online and because I'm Chinese or I at least look Asian, um, they have told me to eat a bat or called me a chick and other things like that. And this is obviously can be seen as xenophobic and racist comments, uh, bullying, of course. And because it's happening online, um, especially for these young people, it's sometimes hard to um, 
seek out punishment for the people who are making these comments. And another thing I'd like to point out is um, that a lot of this this xenophobic sentiment that's being spread um, by political leaders sometimes, um, it gives um, the green light for some of their supporters to give these kind of comments, um, either knowing or unknowing of the uh, effects it might have mentally and emotionally on these young people. So um, these testimonies are very telling. All right, next here are some of the statistics that we found with the questions we asked. So 72% of St. Louis Asian youth reported that they or their family have encountered racist remarks um, since 2019. And 88% of St. Louis Asian youth reported feeling definitely concerned with the increase of anti-Asian hate crimes and incidents. And 40% of St. Louis Asian youth reported feeling that it is unsafe for them or their friends or family to walk alone in public. And as you can see, for almost every single one of these questions, there's an overwhelming majority of people um, showcasing their uh, fear of what's going on um, with this rise in and this senseless violence that's going on and that's being shown in the news um and just going on within their communities and they have a lot of anxiety that the same thing could happen to their family mm -hmm. so some of the key findings um that we found through this uh data is that anti-asian sentiment is often disguised as humor and it is linked to the coronavirus and it takes place on social media the majority of the time however another important thing to state i believe as judge judy said is that this um sentiment is in no way new it's been going on for many decades and right now they have something specific to blame it on um which a lot of the times people may feel give them the right to make these comments and that's in no way true um and the fact that it can be called humor or they feel the privilege to call this type of these type of comments that i stated humor is just unjust and it should be um punished or called out on um in schools all right, so here are some of the current initiatives that um, the Asian American civic scholars are pursuing, um, both to highlight representation within the Asian um, community here in St. Louis and also to um, kind of denounce the hate crimes that are going on. And the first is sharing stories of our grandparents, which I believe is a very personal initiative um, as we see the rise in um, violent attacks on the most vulnerable population of our um, community. I think it's just really important to um, showcase um, how much our grandparents mean to us and the very personal role that a lot of them play in, especially in our culture. And next is an Asian American history project in St. Louis that has been going on for um, over a year now, I believe. And it's just to highlight the long history of immigration we have in St. Louis and the large population of Asian Americans and the contributions they've made towards our society. And a recent initiative that we've actually adopted is trying to integrate um, Asian American authors and their literature into St. Louis school curriculums. And I believe this is one potential solution into starting the conversation around these types of um, topics about um, what's going on uh, right now and what has been going on uh, throughout history in our social studies curriculums and also uh, to be dis discussed among friends with, um, oops, I accidentally went forward. Um, to be discussed among friends if um, these books were to be integrated into their curriculum and in summer reading lists. And this initiative has been pretty successful so far as we've co uh, contacted, I believe, Ledoux, Villa, John Burroughs, and a couple of other uh, schools in Sa the St. Louis city and county area. And they've been overwhelmingly positive about adopting this. And our next initiative is a wellness check-in with the Asian American senior citizens in collaboration with Caroline Fan's organization, the Missouri Asian American Youth Foundation. Much thanks to her. And I think this is a really important thing, as I've said before, with um, the rise in hate to just check in with our um, uh, these people to see how they're doing and get another perspective and to just talk with them um, and empathize with them as well. And um, with all these initiatives, the greater thing we're trying to accomplish is have a really great online community for Asian American youth on social media. And here is our website where we post a lot of updates with um, what we're doing and our Instagram, um, both you can find through these links and username by searching civic Asians on Instagram or typing this uh, URL in. And we have a lot of more 
mm-hmm. uh, relatable content for our Asian uh, youth to become involved in, but also more educational types of content, such as um, why why banning WeChat hurts the Chinese community more than you think. Um, such posts like these help engage the Asian American community more. And we hope to, through these posts, kind of invite more Asian Americans to be more active in these types of roles. So thank you. That's all I have to say uh, today. Thank you very much for listening. Isn't, isn't Juni amazing? I, I love the fact that um, our high school youth leaders um, give them a platform and I mean, I didn't even give them a platform. Um, I, I say I because I am. Um, I helped found this organization in 2018, but when we started the work, I had no way. There's no way for me to predict that they would be accomplishing so much. So I wanted to highlight one thing that is the idea of book initiatives. I'm so proud of the fact that they real quickly identified a list of books uh, that go above and beyond your, you know, Joy Luck cl- Club, and and really focus on more recent. Um, Asian American experiences uh, captured in literature and they've t- taken the initiative to actually reach out to schools because they believe that's the best way to you know maybe uh, enforce some meaningful changes at the youth level so thank you so much all right cool so I'm going to go ahead and, and um, share some data that uh, we were able to get from SIUE. Uh, so Juni's data was collected from the high school community. Um, and, and, you know, that's, that's what the organization was. But um, with um, Lindy's office, we soon, we, we uh, I think it was probably not too long ago when we decided that we should probably also have some data just to kind of get a sense of how this may have affected the um, Asian American and, and including the international student population at SIUE. So we, uh, I think we had just a very quick survey on Qualtrics and we had a little bit under 70 participants. So here's a quick breakdown. Uh, you'll see that we've got a nice, um, uh, distribution of graduate students all the you know first year all the way to graduate students in terms of the uh, how, how they identify you know we've, we've got a about a third of the students maybe more like a, a, a quarter of the students who identify as others so that's probably your you know your biracial your multiracial students and these are the the bigger identity groups we asked some questions uh, about their general sense of concern and fear so as you can see out of 68 or 69, we've got, uh, this is the majority of them said that they've been experienced once or multiple times in terms of racist remarks uh, since 2019. I thought this was a, one of the more positive statistic in the sense that majority of the students did feel safe walking alone in public, grocery shopping around campus. But the number of 17 kind of worried me, I bet, Prior to pandemic, this number should be much, much smaller. I think SIUE, of my many years of, of living there, has always felt very, very safe. The fact that Edwardsville as well. So the fact that we've got actually 17 plus students who don't feel safe often. So that's, that's a little concerning to me. Um, mm-hmm. And then we've got, this is the number of students who feel either definitely or moderately concerned in terms of the anti-Asian hate incidents and crimes. So it, so here are the, some, some of the um, highlights from more of the qualitative comments is that like Junie said earlier and like Ju- Judge Judy mentioned in from her professional and personal experience, these kind of hate can come from strangers, coworkers, customers, fellow students. But I also wanna highlight the fact that um, we had a couple of students about faculty members as well. So um, I, will, I will get to those later. They range from overt attacks, taunts to more subtle jokes and hints. Okay, so you know, so as this this was also highlighted in Junie's comments as well, is that they oftentimes come like, oh, lighten up, it's just a joke, right? So, uh, and and then another important point that was mentioned is this idea of lack of action, lack of support was noted as a source of concern for the Asian American students or Asian students, international students, and a pretty significant theme of feeling that they were not seen on campus. In terms of university conversations surrounding topics of diversity and inclusion, they feel that uh, the AAPI communities are somehow left out of the conversation. And I think that's something that I would love to make sure that 
our university community in large can 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 be become aware of. So I was uh, able to highlight a few comments, and of course, this is my personal uh, selection process. Uh, this is a Chinese American student. Again, these are all SIU students. You know, getting asked what kind of Asian you are, and they demanded that they pull down the mask. I wanted to highlight this one because I know that at the beginning of the pandemic, I felt um, very much. Um, is exposed, especially when I was the only one wearing a mask and I've been told uh, to, to pull down my mask at once as well. So I, I know this feeling, right? Um, and then, okay, this one. This one is a Filipino student, um, is from the health professional program. So I'm assuming either nursing, pharmacy or dental. A man came up to, to them and said, you know, we need to watch out for people like you and the virus. So again, is this instant uh, immediate association uh, of, of linking them to the virus. And, and this idea of being confronted, you know, having stranger coming out of nowhere to confront, confront you, I think is very much a, a, a concerning uh, thing. Next one. Um, this is talking about something happening in the SIUE student dining services, I believe, you know, the cafeteria, she brought, the student brought food that their mother cooked for them. And then this coworker at the cafeteria who actually got promoted to manager, um, told to her, to their face, your food stinks. And, 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 you know, held nothing back and really made it very known to other people. And, um, and felt, of course, this person felt humiliated. Um, and I thought it's interesting because um, I remember Junie on a different occasion gave a presentation about a similar experience and, and uh, his presentation, he talked a lot about how sometimes this kind of teasing would either focus on the smell, the unique smell of our food or the difficult pronunciation of our names. I thought this is a very, you know, experience that seems to echo for a lot of people. This Thai, Thai American third year student talking about a customer getting um, mad that their last name was misspelled as L-I-N, which is more of an, I guess uh, that's a possible Chinese last name. And he was going on and on about how he would never want to be associated with Asians or communism. And, and of course, and then he, they talked about how their boss at work made comments about uh, nail salon and how, how they were frustrated that they're all Asian techs and she can understand them. And so, and then the student also talked about experiences of uh, coming from um, fellow students as well, saying that they have a hard time, um, I guess, have a hard time all since all Asians look the same to them. This Korean American third year student was at work and someone said that you need to go back to China. Uh, this is, uh, this has been, I've heard so many people talk about this experience happening to them. Uh, Indian American, over, overhearing someone talking about China virus came coming to the US because of Chinese students on campus at SIUE, um, made, made them feel very uncomfortable and, and walked away from them. Uh, Vietnamese American student talked about how they, they were attractive to this person because they smelled like Asian spices. Um, a lot of really um, concerning stereotypes and, 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 and in this case, um, you know, uh, hypersexualization of, of Asian women, I think. This is a theme um, about feeling seen by the university. I wanted to highlight this here. This person was talking about what uh, the Center of Student Diversity and Inclusion and the larger university can, community can do about this. And he said, honestly, the friend pointed out that SIUE sends out all emails about diversity or shootings or things that, you know, um, and I, I think that, you know, this is true. And then you say, they said that you never send anything on the Georgia shootings. So as a member of the Asian American community, he felt that this particular dimension of suffering uh, wasn't recognized on campus. The, the, the school didn't really give enough attention to the universe, to this particular issue. And uh, similarly, this was echoed by three other comments. I included one more here. Feel angered, unseen by the university, campus-wide emails didn't talk about this particular issue enough and there was not follow-up actions or, or, or events about this, which I think I, I give the, I, 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 I wanted to just say that I'm, I'm so thankful that uh, Lindy and the Center for Student Diversity and Inclusion 
did uh, put together events like this. So I, I, I'm thankful for that. Faculty words matter. I wanted to highlight this. I, I didn't want to um, share the direct quotes for fear that it may actually expose someone uh, unintentionally, but I can, I can speak that I saw data, two pieces of data that um, indicated that student heard direct comments from SIUE faculty members that were um, inappropriate to say the least. Um, one of them was about how many Asian faculty members does so-and-so college need exactly? Uh, and I, th I thought that was an interesting comment. Uh, so, so, you know, things like that. Um, so here I listed some, some positive words, you know, maybe things that we as faculty members or staff or as a university community can do together, right? So speak with Asian American voices on campus, hear their concerns or frustration. This is recommending what we can do. Emphasizing that blaming average uh, ordinary Asian Americans for the pandemic is wrong and, 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 and re we need to reduce hypersexuality of Asian women, talk about microaggressions, make sure that people know that these terms are not okay, that these words do bring hurt to other people. So I thought that these, these are really good comments as well. I don't want to take up too much time, but I wanted to highlight one more thing. This was a student of mine who did a thesis uh, last year. So what she did is that she actually studied about 150 Chinese students back then in China considering studying in the U.S. And the point I wanted to make here is that this kind of anti-Asian hate and crime is being watched from around the world. And they definitely have a direct impact on things like our outreach overseas and our success in recruiting and retaining international students. Uh, you see a lot of Chinese here, but I wanted to highlight the fact that overwhelming majority strongly agree or agree that they were concerned about this anti-Asian sentiment and instance. They're concerned about the COVID outbreak. And they're even concerned about the government's responses. Back then, this was when the responses were definitely not um, satisfactory or not comforting. So they're saying all of these things are being watched and these students who are actively participating in their program to study abroad, actually to study abroad in a program that involves SIUE, we're saying that these, um, these instances are um, making them re possibly reconsider coming to universities like SIUE. So that, sorry, I took quite a bit of time, but that concludes my part of the presentation. And um, Next, I'm going to pass the baton to Caroline Fan. Caroline Fan is a, a community advocate leader that I respire, uh, sorry, uh, that I respect um, very, very much. Um, she has started so many initiatives and she continues to be active in the community, not only in terms of outreach within the Asian community, but also outreach outside, it, uh, you know, collaboration with other community members. Um, one organization that she founded, which is the Missouri Asian American Youth Foundation, um, has been uh, a wonderful source of support for the student organization that Juni is a part of. So without further ado, Caroline, please take it away. Well, thank you for that really, really kind and gracious um, introduction. I uh, wish I could say I'm surprised by some of the testimony from the students and the data that the students found and that you found and that your thesis student found, but um, I'm not. I'm heartbroken. I'm appalled. I'm outraged. Um, I spoke earlier this week to a young 17 year old pre-American adoptee who was being bullied so badly that her parents withdrew her from her public school. The school was doing nothing. It was not just her um, at that school, which is very segregated in the county white students were calling black students the n-word and again nothing happened um she now goes to private school uh that's prior to covid by the way mm -hmm. so this is unfortunately nothing new the reason why i started this 
organization is, I grew up as a kid in the Midwest, right? I grew up in Chicago and then outside of Chicago. And um, I was bullied, right? I had a lisp. I didn't know I had um, a speech impediment until uh, my parents transferred me actually to public school. And so um, that was really fun being taken out of class uh, noticeably um, in sixth grade. Uh, yeah. Um, there's a lot of personal incidents and stories. But I think for me, when I was 18, after I graduated high school in Skokie, Illinois, which is a town that's known for having a lot of Holocaust survivors, um, a white supremacist from Peoria, Illinois, went on a shooting rampage throughout the Midwest in 1999. And he came to Skokie because of the Holocaust survivors and um, he shot and killed Ricky Birdsong, the Northwestern basketball coach, who was taking a walk out of his house. That was literally Independence Day weekend. Um, and I remember finding out on the news. He went literally on a shooting rampage throughout the West. He went to Indiana. He saw a Korean American PhD student who shot him. And I remember driving home from Baskin Robbins uh, as a teenager, right? Just really worried, right? Like looking around more than normal teenage, you know, driver nervousness, uh, wondering if the people outside were gonna shoot me. And I was 18 when I realized that there are people in this world who will shoot you because you look different. Um, so when Atlanta happened, I felt a little ways, but um, Primarily, I wanted to make sure that others were taken care of, and I did not consider my own safety, frankly, uh, because I have been trying to protect the community here for seven years, and I did not consider my own safety until my friend called me sobbing from D.C., she lives in a 400 square foot studio and she's afraid to leave. And she used to be a journalist in mid-Missouri and she called me sobbing the day after because she said, I, I worry for you and your husband. My husband is an infectious disease expert. So um, he's been on the front lines of all of this for over a year. She said, I am so afraid for you because someone might just shoot you because they look at your face and they think that you are subhuman and they won't know what you do for the community. So that's when I started sobbing. Uh, but really, you know, for a day, I was just trying to organize, pull together a press conference at City Hall that uh, Judge Draper spoke at, that men spoke at. I made it a women's press conference because um, I wanted to center our voices. So I want our kids to grow up to be confident and strong and um you know, I want them to be leaders in the classroom, in the boardroom, in the halls of the Capitol. Um, I had the fortune of serving as the Mosaic Project's very first Chinese international student consultant a few years back. And so when I organize, right, I don't only think about, you know, US foreign Asian Americans like myself. I think about how it feels to be an international student who is terrified, right? Terrified and, you know, it's been very difficult for the last four years for them to come to this country, to stay in this country. And then they see this and they just lock themselves up inside their dorm rooms and didn't come out at night. 
And then I was taken back to when I was in college, 9-11 happened. And my friends were a Muslim who were Sikh, who had brown skin, who wore turbans. That's what they did. And I was 20, 21 at the time and trying to protect my friends, right? And so those are some of the formative experiences that have led to me being an activist and an advocate for our community. Um, and I wish that history did not repeat and that we were not in this moment again. Mm -hmm. um, but here we are. And uh, because of the work that I've done in DC, New York, and 10 different cities, I really unfortunately kind of know what to do, but I shouldn't have to know what to do. So I just want to leave it there and open it up to questions. Yeah, um, for I, I see um, quite a few familiar faces and n names. So please feel free to, um, you know, turn on your, you know, go ahead and just ask the question, either typing it or, or just, uh, you know, since we have a small enough group that we can, we can, we can have more of a dialogue, I guess. Um, one question that we did get is, are there any initiatives being made out to the Asian American adoptee community? And that's such an important question. Um, I don't know if, if my panelists know about any initiative, but when I saw that question, my first response was, um, I know and, and I, I don't know of any, and then we should. I do know um, a, 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 a very, a, a St. Louis non-for-profit organization that's being very to the Chinese Amer uh, to the uh, Chinese adoptees. So I, I know that we've invited them to events but I don't think we've actually reached out to them uh, in, in, in response to some of these issues that we've had recently. But um, that's kind of in the context of the broader question of what, uh, in what ways do we think the Asian community will be shaped, reshaped or changed by this? I think one of the influence will be that we will be uh, rolling up our sleeves and getting to action more. I and mean, we'll be thinking about areas where we need to do more. And this is definitely one of those areas, yes. Um, so there's an organization called Families of Children from China. I don't know if there's a Korean American adoptee organization. Judy would know more about that. Um, you know, so I committed today on social to organizing a training for youth um, on how you organize, how do you build power. And I think that's a great idea to have an adoptee track because that's a wholly different experience. Um, in terms of action, right, for the past seven years during Ferguson, right, because I moved, we moved here three months before Ferguson, um, and then I spent the fall in Ferguson. We've been doing nonpartisan voter registration and turnout, and that's really critical, right, um, for our elected officials to make sure that we are heard, we have to register, we have to be counted in the census. Um, something more fun and hopefully delicious initiative that we're gonna have this summer is something called Melt Away Hate. And I think it's the only kind of thing that someone who's obsessed with ice cream and popsicles and hello hello and bubble tea. Um, so we're gonna have a frozen uh, dessert and drink festival. Um, and I, haven't, you know, I, I hope the youth will be involved. We're gonna, um, it'll be fun. And I think it'll be on Loving Day, Judy. So if you and George would come as honored guests and speakers, um, so many Asian Americans are Hapa, right? Not just Hapa white, but Hapa black. You know, I have friends who are Chino Latino and um, so many of us are in interracial marriages and relationships, so. And, you know, if I could um, answer the question about the uh, Korean uh, network, there's an organization, if you want to take it down, you could just Google them. Uh, they're called KAN, K-A-A-N, Korean American uh, Adoptee Network. And they have been putting out um, uh, emails, et cetera, on, you know, their positions on Stop Asian Hate. So 
you know, that could be one. I don't know who asked the question, but you could plug in into that and uh, get some information. Sounds good. Do we have any questions or thoughts about the um, data that we had from um, SIUE community? I'm curious to see if there are any observations or responses. Well, I, I guess I just want to thank you for organizing this event and uh, thank Judy, uh, Junie and uh, Caroline. So those are really good thoughts, good data. Uh, I have been drafted by SIUE to do international recruitment, especially in China. And uh, uh, Judy mentioned that we need to be positive. And I have been trying very hard to say positive things when I was recruiting. And a couple of positive things are, uh, well, uh, we have, for example, uh, international hospital hospitality program. Uh, so the local families have been extremely, extremely nice to uh, uh, international students, donating furniture and uh, get them to know the, uh, the local uh, uh, society and uh, all kinds of nice things. I also have Chinese students and scholars when they want to ask for directions. Uh, some people just uh, stop everything and it took them walk through a couple of streets to make sure they get the right direction. So I guess uh, in a way, overall, uh, I guess uh, personally, I've been in this country for 36 years now and uh, I really enjoy the hospitality of this country. <laughs> so I would say most of the people uh, in this country are very, very nice, and uh, they try their best to accommodate uh, all kinds of people. But uh, I guess uh, it's, it, it's interesting, Caroline uh, mentioned uh, after 9-11, and that's, that's also the first thing that made me to be, to feel, well, this also could happen to Asian. Because uh, 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 I have a lot of uh, Middle East friends. We have lunch every day, people from uh, uh, Iran, from Turkey, and we have been talking about those issues. But, uh, uh, well, we have to give credit to, at that time, there are a lot of things I did not quite like about uh, President uh, George W. Bush, but uh, there's one thing I have to give him credit. After that, he at least explicitly said, we are uh, uh, Muslim American uh, are certainly uh, not those kind of people. And unfortunately, I guess I do not want to make it uh, too political, but uh, there are things that uh, some uh, of our leaders should have said but they have not. And, uh, but anyway, after 9-11, in spite of uh, what President Bush said, I've seen what happened in the society. And uh, that's the time, uh, uh, of course, I do not want to take away the discrimination that uh, our African-American friends have experienced for a long time. Uh, but uh, at, up to that time, I feel things are at least improving but after 9-11, when I watch our uh, Middle East friends uh, have experience, that's where I feel the crisis. Well, uh, it, it could happen to Asian American also. I have a student from Pakistan and uh, he got a job after graduate, when I moved to Peoria and he experienced people uh, uh, threatened to shoot him. And he, he was really scared. He eventually moved back to Pakistan. Uh, so, but anyway, uh, uh, I just want to thank everyone uh, uh, for, for uh, uh, doing this. That's all I have. For, for my friends who are uh, not from SIUE, uh, Professor G Gu um, is mechanical engineer, is that correct? Yeah, uh, we just uh, changed the name about a years ago. Uh, I'm a chair of the Department of Mechanical and Mechatronics Engineering. Mm -hmm. 
Right. And, and talking about recruitment, Professor Gu's um, extremely prolific. Uh, so his research profile is already uh, a big factor in attracting a lot of students from overseas, I'm sure. Um, yeah. Other, other questions or thoughts? I know we're kind of coming up on time. Yeah, may I comment? Please, please. Two minutes. Uh, first of all, I would very much appreciate this kind of activities, uh, especially thank you for all the speakers. I learned a lot from everybody. So the only comment I have is, it's actually more like a brainstorming. Uh, I think, cause I'm from the scientific field, usually you come up with the best idea about actions is when you run into failure or difficulty you don't know what to do. That best ideas come from there. So that's how you turn negative things into a positive situation. So after I heard all this, my thought is the following. I think I would love to be part of it. If somebody uh, can lead this, I'd be part of it. Is I think uh, like a doc, uh, Professor Gu, I lived in this country for since the nineties. 99% uh, of time, actually, I had a great time, even during the pandemic, while we're all suffering together, but I had, so I appreciate it a lot. And I think my idea is we probably, I think the Asian culture really help uh, reforming this country. This country is evolving and there's so many great things about we can absorb and utilize the Asian culture. For example, a simple example, you have no idea how many people like to eat sushi. Yeah. A lot of you surprised me, right? That's just a symbol. So I think there's a lot of great Asian Americans like uh, uh, everybody here contributing to the society. If somehow we can come up with a very nice updated documentary, a uh, beautiful mm -hmm. one, but from the whole nation base to show the talents from the Asian Americans, how they are contributing to the current development of the society. For example, you have no idea I heard about how many great Asian American doctors. So I, all the time, like so and so, I just want to have a doctor Wu to take care of me. So I heard that again. And I'm sure Judge uh, Judy probably heard a lot of things that the people right prefer her than other. So those are all just like professors. You know, you have no idea how many, I just prefer, prefer a biochemistry professor so-and-so. Uh, so those those are all great things. And, uh, and I think if we can somehow share more about the positive contribution of Asian Americans to the society and get an updated document, uh, to let it out, let all the high school kids know this is the reality. So somebody, somehow a group, I'd love to be part of it. If it's a three year project, five year project, I'm in. So that's all. Thank you so much. Um, on May 25th, actually, uh, we'll be having the third annual St. Louis City Hall Asian Pacific American History Month celebration. And we will be honoring five healthcare frontline workers, including doctors. Um, so I will send that out, uh, I guess, or many or Lindy will send that out as a link. It'll be a virtual. The first year we did it, we had great food and people were able to come and be welcomed into City Hall, where I know our government doesn't always um, welcome us. But uh, the last two years, it's had to be virtual. Thank you. I think that's a great idea. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there was a, a question. I know that we're running a little bit over time, but I wanted to make sure that question gets recognized. Um, what collaboration is there between Asian American, Asian Americans and African American university groups at SIUE? And I have the same question. I don't know if we have any collaboration at a more structured level. I'm sure there are many collaborations, uh, individual faculty level or course level collaboration, research collaboration. But I think the question was more about um, in terms of the advocacy work or, um, right? I, I think that's an excellent question. I think it's it's a good thing to to start. I wanted to say that Prior to the start of this event, Judge Judy and I, we were talking about, and, and, and Caroline is involved in that as well. On the St. Louis side, we started this um, uh, Asian American, African American Community Organization Alliance Initiative. So for the first time ever, we're bringing together kind of community 
maybe not for the first time ever, but my, my idea is that we, 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 uh, we saw um, a, a room full of um, organizations representing very different Asian American uh, civic groups and then uh, leaders from the African community. And we're coming together for the first time to talk about what can we do to better understand each other, better collaborate and better outreach. Um, so I think that's, that's an excellent question. Uh, and if there are any collaboration happening, I would, I know many of us on this panel would love to be involved as well. Yeah. And Indy. Thank you, man. And thank you, panelists. Oh, I just am so grateful for your time and your energy. And thank you, Min, so much for organizing this and connecting us. I think this is, again, a much needed conversation on our campus and in the community in general. Um, and I want to say thank you to all who have made the time to be here. I know this is a very busy week for a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> to the end of the semester. Um, this is actually our final program for the semester from the Center for Student Diversity and Inclusion. Um, and I am so happy that it was this. I feel like this was a really good conversation to have be kind of our final program for the semester. Um, I can absolutely, any of the resources that anyone on this panel wants to send me, send, this, send those out to um, an events to Caroline. So if you have the link, feel free to send that to me and I will send it out to all the participants here. Um, and I will, this is recorded. So if anyone on this call Paul wants the recording as well. I can send that to you. So you're welcome to share it with as many people as you would like. Got it. I see you, Julia. <laughs> because I think that sharing this information, especially the data and the responses that everyone's been sharing, I think is really valuable information. So again, thank you so much. I, again, am grateful for all of the efforts of all of you and in the community, not even the efforts to be here, but the efforts that you're doing, I think is amazing. Um, and I'll, again, participants, thank you so much. And I hope that you have a really great rest of your day, um, a great rest of your semester, school years, all of the above, um, and stay tuned for more events um, coming from the Center for Student Diversity and Inclusion, um, probably no early fall, <laughs> but we'll, we'll try to stay in communication with participants and, um, and people who've attended events. So thank you again, have a wonderful evening, and I will hopefully see you again sometime, yes, <laughs> bye all. <laughs>